up, chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, no surprise, the internet is all abuzz again about everybody's favorite hair loss treatment equivalent to Russian roulette, and it is all thanks to the New York Times who published this clickbaity article with the title, quote, An old medicine grows new hairs for pennies a day, doctors say, unquote. And the subtitle reads, quote, Dermatologists who specialize in hair loss say that the key ingredient in a topical treatment worked even better when taken orally at a low dose, unquote. So, if you haven't figured it out yet from the picture, this amazing new hair loss remedy is none other than low-dose oral minoxidil. Now, low-dose oral minoxidil has been touted on the hair loss forums for years now, so I don't know why this suddenly became headline news, but I guess it must have been a slow news day. Anyways, this turns out to be a completely fact-free article that is based on the opinions of various dermatologists, and to be honest, I've done several videos on oral minoxidil already that I'll link below, so I won't be repeating everything in those videos. After all, I've made my stance on oral minoxidil very clear, and frankly, it hasn't made the hair loss community very happy since I'm not telling them what they want to hear. To sum up my views though, I do not think there is enough safety data to justify its use, but since everyone is talking about this article, I felt I had to address it because I think articles like this do much more harm than good. When you tell people what they want to hear, they're much less likely to care about things like facts and evidence after all. So the article starts out okay by saying that there a lot of useless hair loss remedies that people waste their money on, which of course is true. Go to any hair loss forum and subreddit and half the topics will be about things like scalp tension and broccoli. But then the article pivots right to minoxidil by saying that it is an old and well-known hair loss treatment when used topically, but now it is being prescribed in very low dose pills that cost just pennies per day. So I guess that's supposed to be breaking news, even though the hair loss benefits from oral minoxidil have been known for well over 40 years, and in fact it was this very side effect of oral minoxidil, which led to the hypothesis that it could work topically, which led to the development of topical minoxidil. So, the article says that supposedly this treatment is relatively unknown to most patients and many doctors. Frankly, I wish that were true, as the amount of questions and comments I get about oral minoxidil are fucking unbearable sometimes. You certainly wouldn't guess that oral minoxidil was obscure by reading the hair loss forums and subreddits, where about 90% of the topics right now are related to people taking or wanting to take oral minoxidil and usually asking questions about how to acquire the drug without a prescription. But whatever, let's pretend this form of minoxidil is a big secret like the New York Times is implying. So we then read in the article about how using oral minoxidil in this particular way is not approved by the FDA for hair loss, but instead of cautioning the reader that drugs used off-label have not been thoroughly tested and deemed safe to use for the off-label indication, the doctors quoted in this article seem to think that this is all some big joke. Like, Look how naughty we dermatologists are prescribing oral minoxidil. We're such rebels, man. I mean, fuck what cardiologists say about oral minoxidil. So, one of these dermatologists says, quote, I call us the off-label bandits, a title I am proud to bear, unquote. He then explains that, quote, dermatologists have been trained to understand how medicines work, which allows them to try drugs off-label, unquote. Well, Sure, doctors do use off-label drugs. A famous example of this is dutasteride, which is a FDA-approved drug for enlarged prostate, but is often prescribed for off-label use as a hair loss medication due to its similarities to finasteride, which is an FDA-approved drug for hair loss. Now, dermatologists understand how most skin treatment drugs work, but I don't think they necessarily understand how cardiovascular drugs like minoxidil work. In the United States, at least, dermatology is one of the few specialities that does not require three years of internal medicine training, unlike most other medical specialities like cardiology, nephrology, or endocrinology. So compared to other doctors, they are the least educated when it comes to internal medicine. Dermatologists, what they do is they undergo a dermatology residency that may or may not include just one year of internal medicine training. So while dermatologists are definitely experts in skin diseases, they are not experts in diagnosing or treating heart conditions, which is relevant to using minoxidil. And and I don't say that as a slight against dermatologists. I have the utmost respect for their profession, but I am just recognizing the limitations of their scope of practice, which is important since we're talking about oral minoxidil, which is a cardiovascular drug. At least dermatologists are real doctors though, and like say chiropractors for instance. Are you not aware that I graduated top of my class? I think most people who have heard of minoxidil already know that minoxidil was developed originally as a drug to treat high blood pressure, and it was incidentally found to cause hair 
higher growth. However, because of the high incidence of severe life-threatening cardiovascular side effects, the drug received a black box warning label in the package insert which exists to this day. The label mentions, among other problems, the possibility of developing pericardial effusion, which is fluid around the heart, which creates water pressure around the heart that can interfere with the heart's pumping mechanism, which can be a life-threatening condition. Oral minoxidil can also worsen angina pectoris, which is chest pain, as well as other problems that are potentially fatal. So this isn't just like finasteride where the side effects are just inconvenient. The side effects with oral minoxidil can outright kill you. So being aware of how dangerous oral minoxidil is, Upjohn, the original developers of minoxidil, knowing about minoxidil's potential for promoting hair growth, were able to develop the topical form of minoxidil marketed as Rogaine in the 1980s. There have been many years of experience with topical minoxidil, and it has proven to be a safe and effective form of minoxidil without serious side effects, which is why it is available without a prescription, and it is off-patent so it can be purchased very cheaply as a generic. Meanwhile, oral minoxidil still is prescription only and still has the black box warning, which is a warning reserved for only a handful of the most dangerous prescription drugs in the entire world that are currently on the market. So, the article mentions this black box warning, but pretty much blows it off completely as only applying to high dose oral minoxidil, and supporters of oral minoxidil act like you can get all the hair growth benefits from oral minoxidil while avoiding all the dangers by just using a lower dose of the drug, as if that makes any sense. The reality is, though, is that no one knows that the black box warning only applies to high dose oral minoxidil. Even Dr. Sinclair, who is famous for coming up with the Sinclair hair classification scale for women, and who first introduced low-dose oral minoxidil cautions in this very article that, quote, rigorous studies are needed in which some patients would be randomly assigned to take minoxidil and others a sugar pill, but that has not happened, unquote. The article notes that Dr. Sinclair cut minoxidil into a 40th of a tablet, and many of the comments to this article ask what the actual dose is. Oral minoxidil, you see it comes in two sizes, 2.5 milligrams and 10 milligram tablets, and it turns out Dr. Sinclair used 0.25 milligrams of oral minoxidil in his study. But it's important to note that his original study was on female subjects with androgenic alopecia, and he combined the minoxidil with oral spironolactone, which is an anti-androgen that is effective in stopping hair loss in women, but can't be used in men because of its feminizing side effects. Unlike finasteride, spironolactone blocks all androgens, including testosterone, and not just DHT like finasteride does. So, Dr. Sinclair has been using a very low dose of oral minoxidil, but if you look at the hair loss forums, many people are taking 2.5 5 milligrams of minoxidil daily or more and calling it low dose. Basically, low dose is being interpreted differently depending on who uses it. So low dose oral minoxidil is basically just a meaningless buzzword at this point. It is whatever people wish it to be. As it turns out, some of these supposedly low doses are in the same dose range that people taking minoxidil for high blood pressure use. And certainly you would think the risk of these kind of side effects seen in the black box warning might apply to them even if you do believe that 0.25 milligrams daily is safe, which is not been established. If you look at the original studies of oral minoxidil, 3% of people develop pericardial effusion, which like I said, dramatically increases your risk of dying. So some people may try to argue that these subjects already had a lot of pre-existing medical conditions and it wouldn't apply to healthy people. Even if you were to argue that many people who took oral minoxidil in the past had underlying diseases, such as kidney disease, that can make pericardial effusions more likely to occur on their own, it's clear that pericardial effusions can occur with oral minoxidil without any other cause other than the usage of the drug. Here is a case of a 52-year-old man who was on minoxidil for high blood pressure who acquired a pericardial effusion that went away after stopping oral minoxidil. And here is another case of a 48-year-old man on oral minoxidil for a short period of time who developed a large enough pericardial effusion that it had to be drained out surgically to prevent him from dying. Not only that, an incredibly high number of patients on oral minoxidil develop electrocardiogram changes. In the original studies on oral minoxidil, 90% of patients developed electrocardiogram changes when they started oral minoxidil. So, 
how many people are developing electrocardiogram changes on low dose oral minoxidil? Nobody knows because no one has bothered to look. Dermatologists don't do routine electrocardiograms because it is not their speciality. Even if we look at the studies supposedly showing low dose oral minoxidil is well tolerated, like this study here, we see that systemic adverse effects were common, occurring in about 20% of people with 1.7% needing to stop the drug. And these adverse effects included lightheadedness, fluid retention, tachycardia, which means a rapid heart rate, headaches, swelling around the eyes, insomnia, and hypertrichosis, meaning excessive unwanted hair growth. Already some of these side effects are very serious. If someone has an undiagnosed cardiovascular condition and they introduce a medicine which can cause tachycardia as well as fluid retention, it could cause heart attack or heart failure. And this study did not look at the more serious side effects like pericardial effusion that requires an echocardiogram to diagnose. The study didn't even bother looking at electrocardiograms though, despite the fact that 90% of patients on higher dose minoxidil develop electrocardiogram changes like I just pointed out. So. It seems for a study about the safety of a drug like oral minoxidil, it is pretty damn asinine to not even include an electrocardiogram to see what effect it has on the heart. It would be like doing a study on how effective a product is for regrowing hair and then using pictures like this to prove your point. So some people have argued with me by saying, but Kevin, don't you know that 5% minoxidil has 50 milligrams per milliliter, so obviously that's gonna go systemic too, so I might as well just take oral minoxidil, right? Well, Trooms, it is true that even topical minoxidil has some systemic absorption, but people who keep bringing up this point are not seeing the whole picture. When you take oral minoxidil, it is very rapidly and effectively absorbed from the gut, which results in a rapid peak in serum minoxidil levels after you take a pill. However, when you use topical minoxidil, it is very poorly, and more importantly, it is very slowly absorbed into the skin, so that the serum minoxidil levels are very low, and there aren't any peaks in the minoxidil levels like you would see with oral minoxidil. That's why the concentration of minoxidil in liquid minoxidil is so remarkably high. It is the makeup for the fact that it is so poorly absorbed into the scalp. Many of the studies on the absorption of topical minoxidil are from the 1980s when the drug was first made commercially available. Here is a typical study from that era. In this study, volunteers were given one milliliter of 3% minoxidil up to eight times per day, so much higher than the normal dose. By looking at the amount of minoxidil that appeared in the blood and urine, the investigators were able to calculate the bioavailability of topical minoxidil. So what bioavailability means, it's just what percentage of the minoxidil is absorbed into the bloodstream. The investigators found that the bioavailability of topical minoxidil was at most just 0.55% of the dose applied to the scalp, and it didn't make any difference how often it was applied. So it wasn't very dose dependent, which means the absorption of the drug into the skin is very slow, even at extremely high doses like 50 milligrams per milliliter, which is what 5% minoxidil is. Another study showed that the bioavailability of topical minoxidil was only 1.2 or 1.4% of oral minoxidil, so much, much lower than oral minoxidil. But even more important than this is the fact that the rate of absorption of top of minoxidil is very slow, while the absorption of oral minoxidil is extremely fast. So therefore, much higher peak levels of minoxidil occur with oral minoxidil compared to topical minoxidil. In fact, plasma concentrations of minoxidil after topical minoxidil are less than one-tenth of the concentration achieved after an oral dose. This goes along with the extraordinary safety record of topical minoxidil. In a study of more than 3 million cases of exposure to topical minoxidil, there was no difference compared to a control group in any major medical event, including cardiovascular events, hospitalization, or mortality. That's a pretty damn impressive safety record, which is no surprise at all since you can get the drug without a prescription these days. I should also point out that very low doses of minoxidil, like the dose of 0.25 milligrams that Dr. Sinclair uses, haven't even been compared to topical minoxidil and how well they work. The only comparison study between oral versus topical minoxidil compared one milligram orally per day versus 5% topical minoxidil once daily in women who had female pattern hair loss. As it turns out, the two groups had similar results in hair growth. So we don't know if a quarter of this dose or even of a slightly larger dose of oral minoxidil would be any better than just using 5% topical minoxidil. So 
I know some people are driven to oral minoxidil because they feel they are non-responders to topical minoxidil, and it is true. Some people do not have a sufficient quantity of the sulfotransferase enzyme on the scalp, which converts minoxidil into its active form, minoxidil sulfate. But you don't need to resort to oral minoxidil because of this. It has been shown in clinical research that non-responders to topical minoxidil can upregulate the sulfotransferase activity of the scalp by adding topical tretinoin to their routine, and this usually converts non-responders into responders. Additionally, it has been shown that non-responders to 5% minoxidil will be responders to stronger concentrations of minoxidil, like 10 and 15% minoxidil, although interestingly enough, people who are responders to 5% minoxidil do worse with stronger concentrations, and I made videos about tretinoin and high-dose topical minoxidil, which I'll link below. So, Let's get back to the New York Times article. The New York Times reporter goes ahead and displays her absolute ignorance about hair loss science by saying that male and female pattern hair loss is a normal occurrence with age. But that just goes along with the very credulous nature of this article, where all the positives of oral minoxidil are presented without any counterbalance from any doctor who is skeptical of oral minoxidil. There really isn't much more to this article after this. There's no new data presented. It's just some opinions from some dermatologist. Absolutely no dissenting voices were heard. No cautions were advised given the off-label use of this drug that officially still has a black box warning from the FDA, and they didn't have any expert opinions from people qualified to speak about internal medicine like cardiologists. This article was just a bunch of hype, and all of you Tressless kids bought into it because it told you what you want to hear. Confirmation bias is a real big problem on these hair loss subreddits, and that is probably why the most popular Tressless post of all time is a post from a guy claiming broccoli cures hair loss. For Christ's sakes, Reddit, learn to show a little bit of skepticism and critical thinking skills. When something sounds too good to be true, it usually is. And that's why you don't click on the ads on porno websites telling you there are local women who want to fuck. Unfortunately, most of the people who commented on the article bought into the narrative of oral minoxidil being a miracle drug. So this guy here says, I want it. And this guy says, geez, how can I get this? Misty here wants to get it online without an expensive visit to the dermatologist. Yeah, great idea. Self-prescribing a drug with a black box warning. But truth is, she's in the majority. Almost everyone on oral minoxidil is taking it without a prescription. Well, Fortunately, at least there were some people who actually read the article that had a more balanced point of view. This commentator is a medical chemist and takes issue with the statement that dermatologists know how a drug works in the body. And this reader here, Ben, points out that the black box warning is still concerning given that there are no clinical trials proving low-dose oral minoxidil is safe. Nick here also points out that the article understates the black box warning, so there is some hope for humanity after all. So. This type of article does a lot more harm than good. It reads like an advertisement for low-dose oral minoxidil instead of being a balanced article giving the pros and cons of this drug. It's extremely disappointing this is coming from a publication as huge as the New York Times, but it's hardly the first time this newspaper has been disappointing. So many people asked for my take on this, and that's it. There's nothing new in this article to change my cautious stance on oral minoxidil. Maybe if we get some actual quality research, my opinion will change. By quality research, I am talking about something like a prospective controlled study that includes cardiac monitoring, unlike the retrospective study every low-dose oral minoxidil promoter likes to bring up that doesn't even have any cardiac monitoring, which is kind of a big deal when you're trying to assess the cardiac safety of a drug with known cardiovascular dangers. Now, I know many people get extremely offended by my opinion on oral minoxidil, but I want to make it clear, I am only acting upon prudence here. I don't take issue with people who choose to take oral minoxidil. It is your body and it is up to you what medicine you decide to put into it. I don't judge you for that whatsoever. And this goes for other hair loss YouTubers as well who disagree with me. I respect your opinion and at the very worst at least you're promoting something which works. However, I simply do not feel comfortable promoting this product on my channel. My channel is not huge, but I do have viewers which number in the thousands. And if even one person were to be injured based on the advice I give on this channel, I would never be able to forgive myself. So if people choose to ignore what I say in this video and take oral minoxidil anyways, that's fine. But please, do not demand I promote it on my channel. I am sorry, but unless better data comes out, you are not going to see me recommend oral minoxidil in any capacity on this channel. Okay, that's it. I'll see you next time, Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.